The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Listen now for what the Spirit is saying to the church. Jesus and his disciples went on and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is about to be tricked about to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But the disciples they did not understand what Jesus was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he was asked, what were you arguing? He asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? They all fell silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another who was the greatest. Jesus sat down, called the twelve, and he said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it into his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the Gospel of Mark, as I mentioned last Sunday, this is the last year, the last walk that Jesus has. He knows that he's heading towards Jerusalem, and he knows that he's heading towards possible conflict and ultimately his death. And he's trying to convey that to the disciples, but of course, they cannot hear it. Their minds are wrapped up with other things. Their minds are wrapped up in seeing and recognizing that this movement that they are a part of, this Jesus movement, is actually catching steam. That there are people that are following him. There are crowds that are gathered around. Jesus is doing mighty, massive, fantastic miracles. He has great power. God is with him. They are jazzed. They are all excited about what is happening. And as they journey towards Jerusalem, as they're going through these lands that are both of Jewish uh, settlements, but also have a lot of Gentiles, they see what Jesus is doing, that he's breaking boundaries, that he is not only this massive prophet or uh, person of power, this man of God, that this Messiah is not only a Messiah for the Jewish nation, but he is also this powerful figure for those that are not Jewish, the Gentiles. And they see that this power that Jesus has is helping to find them because they are his entourage. Yet Jesus has an entourage. And they, lo and they love being with him and helping him and seeing the mighty things. They are the people that are there upon the campaign. They see this as a campaign. Just like our political campaigns that never end, apparently, in the United States. They see Jesus on a campaign, a campaign that he is going to be somebody great. Not just great, but powerful. Not just powerful, but he's going to be a leader among leaders. He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to be above the emperor of Rome. They see that in Jesus. They see it. And they're excited, and they want to be a part of it. Yeah, Jesus is talking about going to the cross and dying, and that he's going to be given over. Yeah, that's, that's fine, Jesus, but we know that ultimately, I mean, you're giving us the, the, the ultimate bad story, so that when it happens, you know, it will, we won't be surprised. But we all know, as your entourage, as the disciples are saying, as the twelve are saying. We all know as the entourage that we will succeed. We know that you will become king of kings. We know 
that when you take your place on the throne, they are saying amongst themselves, behind Jesus' back, that we will all have a place in the kingdom that you are about to usher in. We all know that we will become the first of the first. We will have ministries of power in this government. We will be prime ministers. We will be senators. We will be great men that will have many servants. This is the vision that they have as they are watching this powerful movement blow through this backward country and they see the power and they envy the power want to be part of the power they who have no voice see the potential to become the voice those little fishermen that are the sea along the sea that the nobles and princes and kings and emperors and senators of Rome the Greek citizens and the Roman citizens all see and push aside they see that they are coming up it's kind of like the French Revolution the smallest and least of these will become great and they cannot wait and so hence as they are walking along they get into an argument because this is not, kingdoms are not democratic. There is a hierarchy. And so, as it is said in other parts of the gospel, who are going to be sitting on the right hand of Jesus and who's going to be sitting at the left hand of Jesus when he comes into power? Who's going to be the first among equals? I'll put that in quotes. They are arguing who is going to be in the succession of Jesus. This is all very normal. This is a conversation that has happened since the beginning of time, even since going all the way back into the book of Genesis, where we look at the children of Adam and Eve, the story of Cain and Abel. The story of where one brother will take down another brother, who will kill another brother of their own flesh, out of anger, envy, and desire for power. Even though the disciples may have had great intentions, you know, following Jesus, learning about Jesus, learning about the kingdom of God of love, and giving of people, giving to people, you know, of themselves. If they were, you know, making sure if they were truly listening, you know, they were going to usher in a kingdom of God, where it has mercy and compassion, a kingdom reflective of Jesus. Those are great intentions. But what is the old saying about intentions? <laughs> the road to hell is paved with great intentions. Because there's something within us. Even the best among us, there is something always there that with the taste of that little bit of power, of that little bit of possibility, of that little bit of envy, a little bit of all those things that St. James wrote about in his letter, if we get just a taste of that, there is a part of us that turns and possibly and more than likely will fall and will lead us to not giving ourselves freely and unconditionally out of love, but we'll do things in order to amass power, control, to get what we want, to look after our own families first, to see that we are provided for on the backs of others. And this is what Jesus was afraid of. This is what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples at this very critical moment within his ministry. This critical moment that soon he knows that he will not be with them. He wants to make sure that his disciples, his followers, these people that will eventually be called Christians, will understand where they are, their identity in relationship to the world, 
who they are in the light of God, in the light of Christ, in relationship to others who are leaders in the world. Jesus, the great teacher, calls from among them these children. And in the Greco-Roman time period of, uh, of Jesus during this time, um, especially in the Greek and Roman culture, children are to be not heard nor seen. They are actually, you know, go off and they will start working when they're really young, like five, if they can lift a hammer and break a rock, great! This idea that we now have around nurturing children, that's not during that time period. So the fact that Jesus calls out from among these men that are surrounding him, from the women over on the margins that are listening intently, like Mary Magdalene and, and Mary, Jesus' mother, and Martha, and all these other great noble women that eventually become great apostles, he calls from among them a child. A child to, to come, and he places the child among them, this small, vulnerable child, this innocent child, this child whose biggest concern that day perhaps was to eat, but also wants to go play, to enjoy the moment, to enjoy life. Jesus brings this child, this symbol of vulnerability among the twelve that will be his apostles, those that go out with the good news. He brings the child among them and says, whoever wants to be great has to be the last, the least. You cannot, do not aspire to be here. If you are truly to follow me and to be a person of status within the kingdom of God, you've got to be down here with all those that God has a special interest about. For all of you that want to be followers of Jesus, that want to have a place in the kingdom of God, you have to be powerless. You have to be like Jesus. You have to be God that comes to us, to comes and is incarnate in the vulnerability of a baby. Raised in the backwoods, whose life is endangered constantly. Who is a political refugee, wandering from the, the, the country of Israel into Egypt, and then going back into Galilee, back in the far regions, so but nobody sees them or recognizes them, who works manually. Someone who does not have power and is, because of their birth, a servant. Who probably doesn't get minimum wage. This is who we are called to be. If we are going to be Christians in this world, if we are going to be disciples of Jesus, if we are going to have a place within the kingdom of God and usher in this kingdom that God envisions through us, in us, and with us, then we have to be down here. We have to be servants of all. And we lead from down here with no hope and no desire for praise or honor. Vainglory. It's kind of rough, isn't it? As Linda said, as she read, read the letter of James, you know, buckle up. That's kind of what Jesus is telling the disciples. Buckle up. What is yet to come is not going to be what you think it's going to be. Just like life, is it not? What we think and we plan and we hope is not exactly what we, what we plan. But it's out of that ambiguity, out of that 
lowliness, that humility, that we are able to see and truly incarnate what God is doing in the world. We are able to see with God's eyes, honestly and truthfully. When we put away all of our intentions, uh, desires, power in this world. It is in that moment of vulnerability that God becomes incarnate in us and then together in this body that we now call the church. The body of Christ. In the church, many are called to roles of leadership. Yeah, deacons, who serve out of compassion, elders who guide with wisdom, pastors who guide and lead and, and direct and coach and dispense the word of God and the sacraments of life. But none of these are positions of power. All of these are positions of service, of servant leaders. Anybody that wants power in this world, do not become a pastor. <laughs> Because, I mean, that is the least powerful. Especially in the Presbyterian tradition, because, we, because one of the, the, the marks of the Presbyterian tradition is that we don't trust any individual having power. That's why we do things in councils, in groups. We do group decisions. Because you know, we shun ostentation, and we gird ourselves against the temptations of falling into the trap that St. James talks about. But even though we have these ordained or set aside servant leaders from among us, there are always leaders among us that the church is filled with servant leaders. For each has a gift and a calling. And it is when the church calls that person out to be recognized that truly then the gifts that God has given to the congregation are brought in and are brought in so that the kingdom of God can be ushered in in those moments. We lack nothing. God has given us everything that we need for the ministry that we need to do. And over how many years, Jerry? Jerry is, a, is one of those people. She is a servant leader among us. Served as the children's choir director. She, like Jesus, has gathered the children together and has helped them in their Christian formation through music. Music filled with teachings of who we are called to be in the life of God. And none of the songs that, G uh, that Jerry has taught the kids talk about now is the opportunity to take power. About being lambs, God loving the world unconditionally, about calling all of God's children into the arms of God. Brothers and sisters, each and every one of us has a calling, each and every one of us has spiritual gifts, each and every one of us are called into this community known as Southminster, into this community broader known as the church so that we can play a part humbly as servant leaders in building up the body of Christ and ushering in this kingdom that Jesus talks about. Mm -hmm. So today, as we honor Jerry, remember your calling too. It's not about power, it's about service. It's actually about faith, service, and community. Three marks of Southminster Church. So this coming week, listen deeply how God is calling you to serve. And then may we all bless you as you get to it. All praise, honor, and glory be to you, O Christ.